Good morning, everyone. Morning. Good morning. Good morning from me and Mark Hutchett is here as well. You may not have met us before, so I thought I'd make sure you know I'm Reverend June Pettit, and it's Mark Pettit, and we're from Sheffield. And I came to take a service two years ago. So it is quite a while, you might have forgotten, or you might not have met. And thank you for inviting me to tell your service today. The last time I came to speak about inspirations from the life of Jesus. Our churches are in the Unitarian and pre-Christian tradition, so that was something on interpreting Jesus, so that was 2016. Today it is mainly, but not entirely, on the topic of sudden splendours and welcome surprises. More of that later. Now we're going to have the chalice lit, and I've got some words to say. As others before us have sought to make ordinary times special by lighting a candle, we now seek to transform this ordinary time into a special and sacred one by lighting the flaming chalice, symbol of our free religious heritage. Let's sing together now. We're singing number three. And you're in the green hymn book, number three, you sing the joy of living. Number three. We now have time for reflection and for prayer. We begin with some aspirations for today. Our aspirations. To be strong enough to gain some mastery over ourselves. To be humble enough. To be willing to learn from others. To be brave enough to choose the right road, no matter how hard it be. To be patient enough to keep on in spite of obstacles. To be wise enough to know our own shortcomings. To be honest enough to admit the excellences of others, to be proud enough to hold the respect of the strong, to be gentle enough to hold the love of little children, to be careful enough to protect the goods of others, to be generous enough to share our goods with others. These are our aspirations for today. And I'll lead us in prayer, and after the prayer, I will say the Lord's Prayer, which you may wish to join in if you would like to do so. O great source of all souls, may we come together this morning with gratitude in our hearts. May we know that deep thanksgiving, which can be felt in every season, a thanksgiving for beauty, for the patterns of bare trees against a winter sky, for the songs of birds in spring, for the light and loveliness of summer, and for the glorious colours of autumn. May we be grateful too for all those people who are close to us. Through them, may we understand what love is. We know that life brings to each one of us both difficulty and joy, both sorrow and celebration. Yet whatever life brings, may we always be aware of our blessings. Help us to notice those simple joys which life ever brings. And in times of difficulty, show us how we can turn to you, the unchanging source of life, knowing that our world is ever upheld by your spirit of love and beauty. 
Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I put down now the title Choosing a Theme. Well, choosing a theme, it's become a custom to unify a Sunday service by centering on one theme. Now generally, I would certainly say it's a very satisfactory way of doing it, but sometimes there is more than one subject that one would like to talk about. And for today, I was a bit uncertain about which theme to choose. So I decided in the first part of this service just to mention a subject which I would like to have spoken about, but it didn't quite come together for a service. And then for the rest of this morning, my subject will be sudden splendours and welcome surprises. So it wasn't coming together as a service, but one possibility had been to mark 1918, the centenary when some women first got the vote. Some women. There is much around at the moment about this. <laughs> mention the names of a couple who were deeply involved in the women's suffrage movement. Frederick and Emmeline Pevick Lawrence. But just for interest, does anyone know much about them or have heard of them? I wouldn't be surprised if you haven't. Sorry? Heard of them. Heard of them. Heard of them. Right. We've some heard of them. We've usually hear about the Pankers, don't That's we? True. Um, but as I will, I'll tell you a little bit about them anyway, and you'll realise why I wanted to mention them. There's no doubt that the Votes for Women cause was spearheaded by women. However, there was at least one man who at one point in the earlier 20th century campaign played quite a role, and that was Frederick Pevick Lawrence, who came from a long-standing Unitarian family. I've been reading an old copy of his autobiography called Fate Has Been Kind, and it's a remarkable story of a life. And if I pursued this theme for a full service, it would have been about how someone can put so much into trying to make the world a better place. A social justice issue coming from someone who had a Unitarian background, but I would like, have liked to know more about his wife, Emily. Because without her, Frederick would not have been involved at all. Em and Fred, they called them. Em and Fred married in 1901. Frederick Pavick Lawrence was a lawyer and also he was involved in journalism, running newspapers. He also had considerable financial resources. Supporting his wife in what he described as the Women's Rebellion. He used those resources, including his own flat in London. He was crucial in the publication of the newspaper Votes for Women. He bailed out many suffragettes in London when they were arrested. And at one point, the Pevick Lawrences and Christabel Pankhurst were working in a threesome. Then came the arrest of himself, Frederick Pevick Lawrence, and Emma Lane for conspiracy. They got word to Christabel Pankhurst, who escaped to France. And in his autobiography, Frederick Pellet Lawrence describes how at one point in prison he was force fed. He'd gone on hunger strike. There are reasons for this, but I won't go into it. In prison, he was visited by a Unitarian chaplain who became a lifelong friend. And when Frederick Lawrence came out of prison, there were court costs and bankruptcy proceedings, including being made to pay for some of the broken windows broken by the suffragettes. It's quite a story. 
As I say, my dream would have been about how someone could put so much into trying to make the world a better place. A social justice issue. But I thought, following that, we would put my hymn box and sing hymn 68, which reminds us to recognise what people have done in the past through their lives. I like this one because it's not just about the famous people, it's therefore a challenge for anybody. It's hymn 68. For when Frederick Pellick Lawrence was imprisoned for his part in the Votes for Women campaign, he recorded how important little things could become when you are in prison. He wrote, owing to the monotony and limitation of prison life, small things make a great impression. Sunshine on the wall, the song and flight of birds were his examples. We are here in stillness, we are here in prayer, we are here in silence, nothing can compare. And now in our silence let us think of anyone we know who is suffering in some way at the moment. We may wish to say a silent prayer, perhaps someone who can't be with us today or anyone you know is troubled by ill health, or loss, or stress. Gracious Spirit, we ask for courage when we need to change those things that can be changed. And we ask for patience to bear those things that cannot be changed. And we ask for the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. So I've been thinking about how sudden splendours and small surprises of a fine and helpful kind can help us on our way, can make a difference. Be open to sudden surprises, whether in the natural world or indeed through the world of human kindness. And sometimes we need some humility in this, in our openness to the world. And remember that in the Bible, Jesus tells his disciples to be like children. Matthew chapter 18. He called a child whom he put among them and said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now there are a couple of ways we can interpret this. First, it was about humility, as it says. Think about how children would not have had any status in those days in that society. So, don't be full of yourself, constantly seeking to be top dog, that's what it says. It's also been interpreted to mean that we should be open, like children are, to those small welcome surprises and sudden splendours. Be open to the wonder of the world around you, for children, everything is new. Be mindful. Don't miss the surprises. We would not want a surprise-free world. In a longer piece, retired Unitarian University's minister in the States, Reverend Richard Gilbert, wrote, Let me not live in a surprise-free world. Grant me childish glee as if I saw the world for the first time. Allow me the joy of seeing old things in new light, be it the tree at my window, the every Monday task at hand. Furnish me with new words to celebrate the fresh surprise of every day. And if not, let me hear the old world words with new ears. Let me sing the old songs as if for the first time. 
Strengthen me so that I refuse to succumb to the lures of a flat universe that has no room for surprise. Well, sometimes when we might be feeling a bit fed up, or perhaps we are focusing on a sorrow, the sad feelings can be interrupted by a sudden splendour. And I like Miriam Wilson's piece about sudden splendours. The sudden splendour might often be something in nature, a shining day in the midst of February gloom, or so small a beginning as a chance shaft of light through the clouds, perhaps the sight of a stunning rainbow. Something which, in its beauty, brings a deep sense of peace. So we experience something in our outer world through our senses, sight, or perhaps sound, it could be birdsong, which speaks to us deeply in our inner world. I remember once when Mike and I went away to the Wirral. We walked next to the estuary of the River Dee. It was near West Curley. At times, looking at the view, it was uh, it's an estuary, it's more or less a muddy channel with a little bit of water. But when we made the effort to go and have a walk along there in the evening and the sun was going down, the whole muddy channel was lit up with wonderful colours reflecting on the patches of water which were there. Perhaps you've had moments like that. They seem insignificant really when we retell them. But I feel we have been made to be open to such moments. Our senses draw information from the outside world and at times this information goes deep within us and illuminates something we might call soul, our souls. So we are encouraged to like children be open to the world. So it's often something in nature but there are those other welcome surprises which can come through our human world. Now, I'm not talking about winning the lottery or anything like that, rather something much more common than winning the lottery is sometimes thought of as the little things. Now these welcome surprises technically don't just happen like a sunset happens, rather they are helped to happen through people, by people, that they can surprise others. Perhaps People shaping our lives, our environment, through thoughtfulness. I have a little bit of that from Wikipedia about random acts of kindness. A random act of kindness is a selfless act performed by a person or people wishing either to assist or to cheer up an individual person or people. Phrase may have been coined by Anne Herbert, who says she wrote, Practice random kindness and senseless acts of beauty on a placemat in a restaurant in 1982 or 83. And she actually changed the phrase random acts of violence, senseless acts of cruelty, to a practice random kindness and senseless acts of beauty. I do know that. The University of Sheffield Chaplaincy occasionally practices random acts of kindness on the campus. There is a simple aim, they say, which is spreading joy and encouraging others to pass it on. So what do they do? Well, once or twice a year, a group of chaplaincy staff head out around the campus to give out fruit and biscuits, alongside some suggestions of some random acts of kindness, such as clean, a communal area and make everyone's day that bit brighter. Well, I understand that National Random Acts of Kindness Day is celebrated on February the 17th and it grows in popularity to encourage acts of kindness. I wonder if um, anybody's come across this or whether they've had it in the, on the Newcastle campus, Random Acts of Kindness. 
haven't met them. They might be, we don't know. We don't know. Okay. Our sudden splendours and welcome surprises. Look out for them. And one significant aspect of this is that they can come when one is going through a difficult time, not just come when one is meant to be happy. They come in the midst of joys, but also sorrows. It won't be possible for a congregation to put together their sudden splendours and welcome surprises and form a service. Of course, any reaction to a tackle like this from people is likely to be very varied because it's always the case. Individuals interpret the theme in their very individual ways. But it could be an interesting topic, either for discussion or for a group to put together a service. Mark Moshe de Wolf was a Unitarian Universalist minister in the States. I believe he also worked in Canada. He lived from 1953 to 1988, and he wrote the following. With what benediction shall I leave you? This, in your life, May you know the holy meaning, the mystery that breaks into it every moment. May you live at peace with your world and at peace with yourself. And may the love of truth guide you in your every day. In your life, may you know the holy meaning, the mystery that breaks into it every morning. I just wanted to finish with a, a little story about an unexpected stairway from the Meditations Collection by Barbara Road. Two people, a couple, husband and wife, at a small hotel in Bergen, have been there for two days before they discovered the stairway. They were able enough to take the stairs, but had always taken the lift. Save time, they thought, and energy for exploring that charming Norwegian town. After breakfast on the third day, when the lift seemed slow in coming, the husband decided to walk up, as you do. And then, when he got up there and met his wife again, he said, let me show you something and led his wife back down the stairs he had just come up. Well, she was dazzled. Instead of the sterile institutional look of most hotel stairways, this one had the warm beauty of an art lover's home. There were bright paintings on all the walls, and at each landing a rug in jeweled tones, a table with fresh flowers, an exquisite chair or two. And when they reached the first floor, they looked again, filled with energy, drinking in the beauty. We might have missed this, they said. And thoughtfully, they agreed. Have to be careful about saving time and losing life. I realise, of course, that for this story to work, you have to be someone who is able to walk up the stairs, but I'm sure there are other examples of care, providing a pleasant environment for others. Here we have an unexpected surprise, one of the little things that makes a difference. And so to conclude this address, I shall repeat Mark Moshe de Wolf's words. In your life, may you know the holy meaning the mystery that breaks into it every moment. Amen.